ओम सराशव समारंभा शंकराचार्य मध्यमा हस्मराचार्य पर्यता वंदे गुरुपरंपरा ओम परमेश्वर प्लीज बी सीट इट ओम Okay, you have a problem here. Did you push the uh wide? Yeah, that's what I was going to do. It's it hasn't moved. Okay. Sorry, I'm just having some problems here. <coughs> All right. Good. Om sahana vavatu सह नौ भुनक्थु सह वीर्यन खरवाह तेजस्वी नवधीतमस्तु मिद्विषावह ओ शाति 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 ओम वेरी गुड आर वी रिकॉर्डिंग ओके Okay, thank you. I think my voice during the meditation, my voice feel quite low, I think. Okay, can you hear me okay now? <laughs> All right. Okay. So, welcome back. We have finished our study of the 18 chapters of the Bhagavad Gita. We have also concluded our uh, study of the Gita Dhyanam. the verses usually recited before a uh, uh, recitation of the bhagavad gita um starting today we'll go through a review of the bhagavad gita the purpose of that review is twofold one is to obviously review but the second one i think is more important and that is it would be nice if you knew where to look in the bhagavad gita to find particular topics and i'll give you some resources and how you can do that but that's our our goal for this review it may take several uh classes what we'll do though during the review is we'll start each of these classes by reciting i think half of the gita dhyanam each time so we'll recite the first half today and we'll recite the second half next week and like that will continue and as always as i'm reciting please glance at the uh, translation and then repeat after me om parthaya pratibodhitam bhagavata om parthaya pratibodhitam bhagavata narayane na svayam narayane na svayam vyase na kratitham purana munina vyase na kratitham purana munina madhye maha bharatam madhye maha bharatam अद्वैतामृतवर्षिणी भगवती अद्वैतामृतवर्षिणी भगवती अष्टादाध्यायनी अष्टादाध्यायनी अंब मनुसंदी अंब मनुसंदी भगवदगीते भवद्वेशनी भगवदगीते भवद्वेशनी नमोस्तु ते व्यास विशाल बुद्धे नमोस्तु ते व्यास विशाल बुद्धे फुल्लारविंदाय थपत्र नेत्र फुल्लारविंदाय थपत्र नेत्र ये न 
Swaya Bharata Thaila Purnaha Yena Twaya Bharata Thaila Purnaha Pradjwali Tognana Maya Pradipaha Pradjwali Tognana Maya Pradipaha Prapanna Parijataya Prapanna Parijataya Totra Vetraika Panaye Totra Vetraika Panaye Jnana Mudraya Krishnaya Jnana Mudraya Krishnaya Gita Mrita Duhe Namaha Gita Mrita Duhe Namaha Sarvo Panishado Gavo Sarvo Panishado Gavo Dogha Go Palanandanaha Dogha Go Palanandanaha Parto Vatsa Sudhir Bhokta Parto Vatsa Sudhir Bhokta Dugdham Gita Mrtam Mahata Dugdham Gita Mrtam Together chant Vasudevasutam Devam Kamsa Chanura Mardanam Devaki Paramanandam Krishnam Vande Jagat Guru very nice. That's the first half of the Gita Dhyanam. We recite the second half next week. Hmm? I'm not sure why this is not working. All right. There we go. All right. <clears throat> so we begin our review, our overview of all 18 chapters of the Bhagavad Gita. This breakdown of the Bhagavad Gita in the 18 chapters into three groups of six, we've discussed at each breaking point in the Bhagavad Gita during our classes. But just to reflect on that once again here before we do our, our review, there are two conventional ways of dividing the 18 chapters up into three groups of six. And neither of them is perfect. They're just ideas. They're, don't, don't take it too rigidly. So one is to divide, them, to divide up the chapters by topic, where the first six chapters are mostly concerned with the individual person, the jiva. The middle six chapters are mostly considered with Ishvara, God of the cosmos. And last, uh, you know, here, here, this to to assign twum to chapters one through six makes sense. To assign tut to chapters seven through twelve also makes sense. To assign a c to the final group of six chapters is arbitrary. It, it's but after tut and twum, a c is left dangling. So I would call this an arbitrary association, not terribly meaningful. Another way of dividing up the book, the 18 chapters, is by the main practice taught. Obviously the karma yoga topic, it predominates in the first six chapters, but remember it comes back in chapter 18. So it's not only stuck in the first six chapters, it's absolutely the predominant uh, topic. Uh, bhakti is, ap is a definitely a predominant topic of the middle six chapters. And jnanam, but not specifically atma-jnanam, self-knowledge. Jnanam in a more general sense. Remember, a lot of the final uh, six chapters were dedicated to an analysis in, in terms of the three gunas. That came in at least three, three and a half chapters. Of, of that final six chapter section is a discussion about the three gunas. So jnanam is appropriate, but not narrowly as self-knowledge, atma jnanam, but jnanam in a more general sense. So this is a helpful like blueprint 
for the whole Bhagavad Gita, so you can get some general sense of what's going on. Um, let me share this with you. Uh, this is probably 30 years ago. I did an outline for myself. And this is the first part of the outline. It shows at the top, chapter one, Arjuna Vishada Yoga. And then it divides up each chapter by individual topics within that chapter. So I note that in verse one, we have Dhritarasha asking about the battlefield. In verses two and six, we see the beginning of Sanjaya's response. In the far left column, you see code words, D for Duryodhana, S for Sanjaya, A for Arjuna, and you can imagine what K stands for. <laughs> So this, and then in the next column, you'll see identification of verse numbers. And then to the far right, those are verses that I considered particularly important. Within that range of verses that I picked out one verse as being, being more significant or more representative. Now, this continues in quite some detail for all 18 chapters. I did this for my own analysis. You may find it helpful. We're not going to use this here because I think it's, it's way too structured and, and way too uh, academic, to be honest. Um, so we won't be using it here, but some of you may find it helpful. And it's posted on our website um, where you find the Bhagavad Gita. I think it says, uh, uh, audios and texts. If you click on that link, you'll find this uh, file and, and much more. So if you want this kind of analysis, you can go to our website and download this particular uh, file. I think it's a PDF and that may be a good uh, resource for you. It was early on, I was very, actually, I have to be honest, what was valuable for me was composing this. <laughs> I've never used it since. I think it served its purpose when I did the analysis and came up with this, uh, this chart. You may find it helpful. So instead of using this, we are going to use for our, our um, overview, we are going to use this English translation that I composed long ago. Uh, the English translation, as you remember, follows the meter of the original, and the advantage here is we can chant these verses together, which we'll do, and get the meaning immediately without any commentary. And then what we'll do is, instead of me commenting on each word or each verse, I'll comment on each section. So in, you know, we'll, we'll see a section of verses and then we'll pause, I'll discuss it a little bit. We'll see the next section of verses and we'll pause and discuss it. I think you'll find that very helpful. We've done this once before and we'll, we'll do that again here. Um, the title of chapter one, Arjuna Vishada Yoga. Vishada means the sadness, the grief of Arjuna. And here it's a good point place to point out that the term yoga in the chapter titles does not necessarily mean spiritual practice. You're used to karma yoga means the spiritual practice of karma. Bhakti yoga means the spiritual practice of bhakti. Arjuna Vishada yoga means the spiritual practice of being sad. <laughs> like Arjuna, you get, you get the point. So the term yoga in the titles is a convention and simply means title so, or chapter. So Arjuna Vishada Yoga is the chapter yoga, talking about Arjuna's Vishada, his grief. And these titles, by the way, are not part of the original text, not part of the original Mahabharata. They've been added by later scholars. Okay. Anything else we should do before beginning? I think that's good. So, you to uh, this work? Yeah, good. <clears throat> to uh, get you started,
For the first verse, um, you can listen and repeat. Just remember the chanting style, and then uh, we'll, ch we'll recite together in unison. After that, I'll remind you of the context, which is quite important. The context is not for the opening chapter and opening scene is not the battlefield, but Dhritarashtra's palace, where Sanjaya is asked what's going on on the battlefield, asked by the blind king. Sanjaya, you remember, was given the power to see and hear everything happening on a battlefield. He was given that uh, power by Rishi Vyasa. With the use of that power, he then responds to Dhritarashtra's question, and then Sanjaya. Dhritarashtra speaks only this very first verse. The rest is narrated by Sanjaya. And then in the course of Sanjaya's narration, we see the dialogue between Krishna and Arjuna. We'll see all that as, as we continue. First verse, listen and repeat. <clears throat> Dhritarashtra said, Dhritarashtra said, Assembled on the battlefield, Assembled on the battlefield, Field of Dharma, the Kuru's land, Field of Dharma, the Kuru's land, There stand my sons and Pandu's sons, there stand my sons and Pandu's sons. What did they do, O Sanjaya? What did they do, O Sanjaya? We'll chant together now. Sanjaya said, Seeing the Pandava's forces Drawn for battle, prepared for war, Prince Duryodhana then approached his teacher Drona, and he said, So now who's speaking this? Not Sanjaya. Sanjaya is narrating it, but it's Duryodhana is now speaking to Drona. <laughs> so you have to get all these details in. Okay, so this is uh, uh, Duryodhana addressing Drona together. Behold, O Master, standing here, the mighty troops of Pandu's sons, organized by your shrewd pupil, Drishtadyumna Drupada's son, archers bold who in war can match, even Bhima and Arjuna, Abhimanyu Virata too, all of them mighty warrior chiefs. O Drona, may you now observe our own warriors illustrious, Bhishma, Karna, Ashwatthama, and Kripa the victorious, Many other heroes stand here who have staked their own lives for me, equipped with weapons of all kinds, highly skilled in the art of war. The strength of our own troops is vast. Bhishma protects them all from harm but their troops' might is limited, even though Bhima guards them all. And we'll pause here. So here we see here the opening scene on the battlefield as narrated by Sanjaya, and we see Duryodhana's typical arrogance. Everyone is ready to give their lives for me. Very significant. And he is with pride describing his, his warriors, his side, to, the, um, to Drona. And he concludes that their troops might as limited. He, he says, our army is more powerful, their army is less powerful. By the way, a warning, this verse is translated in two opposite ways. Some say that the Pandava army is greater than the, the Kaurava army, and some say the opposite. And if you look at all the traditional commentaries, 
you'll find that even the commentators are divided <laughs> about which meaning. And it, it has to do with one Sanskrit word that is ambivalent in its meaning. Like in English, well, anyway, there are several ambivalent words in every language. So based on that ambivalence or different uh, translations. This one, I think, is highly preferable for various reasons. One is, is some details, and that is that Pandava army is actually larger than the Kaurava army, is one reason. Second reason, wh why would Duryodhana say our army is inferior to Thor's? He would never say that. Anyway, just if you happen to see this verse translated in the other way, it's okay, but this is definitely preferable. Now, next scene. You've all watched, I th most of you, I think, have watched that uh, B.R. Chopra 96 episodes of Mahabharata. I enjoyed that. I learned some Hindi going through that thing, cup twice, I think. Um, you know how dramatic many of the scenes are. So here comes the drama. So the, you can just imagine the armies are gathered on both sides and then comes all the noise making as they get ready to, and the Hindi word they use again and again, Akraman, <laughs> attack. <laughs> okay, let's see this next part. <clears throat> I'm going to raise the pitch a little bit. Hmm. Then the conches and kettle drums, cymbals, tabors, and trumpets shrill, all resounded quite suddenly, blaring forth so tumultuous in a glorious chariot to which white stallions had been yoked stood Lord Krishna and Arjuna, on holy conscious they did blow, Yudhishthira and Bhima too, Abhimanyu and Drupada, Drishtadyumna and Shikhandi, upon great conch shells they all blew, the hearts of Dhritarashtra's sons were shattered by the dreadful roar, blaring loudly resounding far through the sky and around the earth. We'll pause here. So remember now this is Sanjaya narrating the sea battlefield scene to the blind king uh, Dhritarashtra. Look at Sanjaya's observation here. Both sides of the battlefield are making lots of noise. Who makes more noise? Looks like the Pandavas are making more noise because the hearts of Dhritarashtra's sons were shattered by the dreadful roar. And he's, Sanjaya, of course, is telling this to the father of, the, of Duryodhana and all those warriors. So it's upsetting for Duryodhana to hear, hear this, but Sanjaya made a point of narrating this. Now, finally, Sri Krishna enters the scene together. Then seeing Dhritarashtra's sons, their swords raised high, prepared to fight, Arjuna, taking up his bow, addressed Lord Krishna with these words. Arjuna said, O Krishna, steer our chariot <coughs> between both armies gathered here, so I can see those eager to fight whom I must now engage in war. Sanjaya said, Arjuna then beheld them all, his uncles, teachers, brothers too, nephews, cousins, and grandfathers, sons and grandsons, and friends as well. He surveyed all those gathered near, 
a mast in armies on both sides, then with his great compassion stirred. Arjuna said in deep despair, Arjuna said, O Krishna, seeing my own folk, here assembled, eager to fight, <clears throat> my body shakes, my limbs fall limp, my mouth is parched, my hair on hand. Another good point to pause and reflect. So, Arjuna, you know the story so well. Uh, Sri Krishna drives the chariot out onto the battlefield. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> Arjuna looks across the battlefield and he sees among his enemies so many beloved family members. And in fact, that's what it's in response. Actually, that, that's, that's coming. All the family members are coming. Let's just put it, hold off on that idea for just a moment and put it in these terms. Arjuna is now sensing, actually that is an important point, we can't set it aside. Arjuna is sensing the magnitude of the situation and look at his response. My body shakes, my limbs fall limp, my mouth is parched, my hair on end. It would be a huge mistake to assume that Arjuna is frightened. Absolutely not. And the following verses will make them will make that extremely clear. Arjuna is overwhelmed by his emotional response to seeing his family members and friends among the enemies, which we'll see in just a moment. He is torn apart. What tremendous inner conflict when he realizes that he is about to go into mortal combat with his own friends and family members. That just rips him apart emotionally. You've heard me say many times that Arjuna suffers what today we would call a panic attack. Look at his symptoms. My shaking, limbs fall limb, mouth is parched, my hair is standing on end. At the uh, very last verse of, of uh, chapter one, he, in fact, in fact, does he say that? That's the next verse, right? Yeah, let's see this next verse. My bow slips from my quaking hand, and my skin seems to burn with fire. My mind is spinning round and round. No longer can I even stand. Look at that. He's dizzy, and he can't even stand. He falls to the seat of, his, of the chariot. Arjuna is not afraid. This is not a reaction of fear. This is a panic attack brought on by the realization that he's about to enter into mortal combat with people he loves. Think about the inner turmoil as a result of that. So strong enough to create this this uh, panic attack, and you may have heard me comment before, that Arjuna was arguably the mightiest warrior on the battlefield. And here we see Arjuna has been incapacitated. Can, by the way, can you fight when you're too dizzy to stand up? Arjuna has been incapacitated before the first arrow has been fired incapacitated by what, right? His own emotions. That is so significant. We won't, we could spend the rest of the class talking about that, but we already have, but just to recognize the, the importance of this. So now we, we discover why his emotional reaction is so strong, not because of fear. Let's see this next part. Our own teachers and relatives, for whom we are prepared to fight, all stand arrayed for battle here, giving up their own lives and wealth. 
I do not want to slaughter them, even if I am slain instead, since after killing our own folks, how could we live in happiness? How could we not be wise enough to turn back from this dreadful sin by discerning the awful wrong of destroying our family? If our family is destroyed, ancient dharma will perish too. And when that dharma has been lost, a dharma will prevail for all. The social order will decline and our women will be defiled. Those whose clans are corrupted thus are damned to hell, so we have heard. Something interesting is going on here that you may not have picked up on. Arjuna is talking about dharma being lost. What is the reason for fighting this battle? To preserve dharma. It is a dharma yuddha, it is a war to preserve dharma, not to destroy it. But what is Arjuna's argument? And what's interesting is Arjuna knows it is a war to restore dharma, to preserve dharma, and instead he argues for the opposite. It's an argument based on his emotions. Intellectually, he knows the war is fought to restore dharma, to maintain dharma. But now his and we're going to keep this short. I can go on talking about this for all, all day. His emotions have hijacked his, emo his intellect, and his intellect now is being used to, in, we, in English we call it rationalization. Rationalization is to make something that you know is wrong to make it sound okay. Right? So it's the example you've heard me give before is when you tell yourself, just this once. That's a rationalization. This is Arjuna's equivalent to just this once. It is a rationalization. It's not true. And that's a point I want you to understand. This is Arjuna's thinking based on his emotions. <coughs> In fact, my guru used to call this emotional thinking. Emotional thinking is not rational thinking. It's not correct thinking. This is Ar Arjuna's emotional thinking, his rationalization. Let's continue. <clears throat> oh, alas, we are now prepared to commit such a grievous sin, driven to slay our kith and kin, by our greed to reclaim the throne. If Dhritarashtra's well-armed sons were to slay me while I did stand, unarmed, resisting not at all, this would be far better for me. What is Arjuna proposing in that last verse? Yeah. You've, you've heard, you know, the, you know, if somebody, you, you know the expression suicide by cop? When somebody pulls a gun or, or even fakes pulling a gun in front of some police because they want to be shot, they want to be killed. This is Arjuna's equivalent to suicide by cop. You throw down his weapon, stand there and become target practice. This shows the extent of his emotional turmoil. Makes sense. Somebody commits suicide. By the way, I, sh I should catch myself. Psychologists say that the term commit suicide is not appropriate. So, to be because it's, it's the person who dies, they say instead of committing suicide, 
the, pro the proper term today is to die by suicide, to die of suicide. And psychologists are stressing that because whoever takes their lives is not doing it out of choice. It's not a choice. When you say commit suicide, it sounds like, oh, I'm going to choose. It's much more complicated than that, involving the emotions. So when you say commit suicide, it sounds like it's a rational choice. It's not a rational choice, which is why uh, psychologists say, we should say someone dies due to suicide, just as you might die due to cancer, you might die due to alcoholism, people do, you can die due to suicide. Anyway, just a little bit of an aside, but maybe an important observation. That brings us to the last verse of chapter 1. Sanjaya said, Arjuna, having spoken thus, slumped down upon the chariot seat, casting off his arrows and bow, afflicted by great misery. What a way to end the first chapter. Pretty grim. It's worth observing here that the spiritual teachings of the Bhagavad Gita have not yet begun. They'll only begin in verse 11 of the next chapter. This is a good reminder that this Bhagavad Gita are 18 chapters excerpted from the 2,000 chapters of the Mahabharata. We're getting this little 700 verse sliver of the 84,000 verse original. So what we're seeing here is the story of the Mahabharata being told. This chapter, by the way, even, even the, this is a little bit of a side topic, let me make it very brief. Why these 18 chapters? You could easily have included five previous chapters, or you could easily have excluded this chapter, but whoever made this choice chose well. <laughs> if you read the previous chapters, they're not so impressive. If you left this chapter out, it would be just a huge gap. So this, the 18 chapters were chosen by some great scholar or saint, we have no idea whom, but chosen well, very well chosen. Okay, now, we begin chapter 2. The title of chapter 2 is Sankhya Yoga. Now, Sankhya happens to be the name of one of the six traditional schools of Indian philosophy, one of the six darshanas. But at the time of the Bhagavad Gita, the word Sankhya didn't quite have that meaning at that time. It does today. But at this time in history, it had a more general meaning. The word Sankhya literally means counting. And, and counting because the system of thought we now call Sankhya was based on a 24-fold division of, of everything that exists. But that's our modern view of Sankhya. In ancient times, it simply meant spiritual knowledge. So that division, uh, the, this, there was a division between Advaita Vedanta and Sankhya, between Vedanta and Sankhya, and Yoga, and Nyaya, and Vaisheshika, all of these split off, but that split occurred after the composition of the Mahabharata. So we're now looking at the pre-split time. Sorry for this elaborate, uh, elaborate discussion. Otherwise, you won't understand what the title means. Sankhya Yoga simply means yoga, the chapter on Sankhya, spiritual knowledge. No other translation is as accurate as that. So we see that. And the chapter has that name because this is where uh, Sri Krishna's spiritual knowledge starts to be taught 
but not at the beginning, only with chapter, uh, verse 11. So let's see the beginning part of chapter 2, which continues the story portion of the Mahabharata. Together? Sanjaya said, Then Lord Krishna did thus address Arjuna sunk in deep despair with eyes downcast and full of tears overcome by his tenderness the blessed Lord said, O Harjuna, how can you be disheartened at this crucial time? Your impious and shameful mood will bring you down in great disgrace. Yield not to this unmanliness, for it befits you not at all. Cast off this mean faint-heartedness. Arise and fight, O Harjuna. Good. So here, I, I think in modern terms, we might call this tough love. <laughs> Remember, Sri Krishna is Arjuna's what is it? The kids, they call it BFF. <laughs> really, they're, they're close friends. And, and uh, you know, friends usually don't, don't call you a wimp. Yield not to this unmanliness. Klybium ma astu. Don't, and literally, don't be like a castrated male. The modern English for that is, don't you have any, what you'd say to a man, and I'll, I'll leave the word out. <laughs> That's the strength of Sri Krishna's statement. And yet he is Arjuna's best friend. This is clearly tough love. And it's appropriate also, because Arjuna is a mighty warrior. If, can you imagine if you're my, uh, what did I, when I teach this, I've, the metaphor I use again and again is a locker room during a football game, the team is losing, and the, the captain of the team has his head down, the coach comes over to the captain of the team, do you think the coach will pat him on the head and say, oh, don't worry, don't be sad, you'll do better in the second half. You know, you know the coach is going to use every four-letter word in the dictionary <laughs> to encourage this, this uh, guy to get up from the bench and go out there and fight. That's the sense of the, of the uh, tough love here. So the words are indeed harsh, but appropriate to the situation. Now the question is, does tough love work? And there's an important point here, and this is, this is, allow me to share this because it's really crucial to understanding the Gita. You've heard me say many times that for an emotional problem you need an emotional solution, for a spiritual problem you need a spiritual solution, and it looks like Arjuna has an emotional problem, and this tough love is an emotional solution to that emotional problem. Clearly, it doesn't work. It is an emotional solution. The tough love is an emotional solution for Arjuna's emotional problem, but the problem is much more than an emotional problem. It is also a spiritual problem. And what is a spiritual problem? You might be surprised. You could say that Arjuna's spiritual problem is fear of death, but not fear of his death, right? He's afraid of the death of his beloved family and friends. It is fear of death. Usually we think of fear of death with regard to ourselves. Arjuna is ready to die. You saw that in the first first uh, chapter. So it's not fear, Arjuna is afraid of death, not his own death, but that of his loved ones. Fear of death is clearly a spiritual problem 
and not an emotional problem. So here's where the transition begins to take place. We're going to leave the emotional dilemma behind and Sri Krishna is going to turn the direction towards spiritual discussion. That won't come for several more verses. We see here Arjuna is still struggling emotionally, struggling with the spiritual problem, fear of death. That's it. He is struggling with fear of death, the death of his loved ones. Let's see Arjuna's struggle. <clears throat> Arjuna said, O Krishna, how can I oppose Bhishma and Drona in this war? How can I pierce with arrow sharp those worthy of my reverence? Rather than slaying such great men, better to live a life of alms, since by killing them I would gain their wealth and treasures stained in blood. By weakness I am overcome. As to dharma I am confused. Tell me for certain what is blessed. I am your student, teach me please. Okay. Later in the Bhagavad Gita, there's going to be a discussion about sannyasa, renunciation. The roots for that discussion about renunciation, chapter 5, is called sannyasa yoga. The roots for that this later discussion is this first verse here. He says, rather than sl slaying such great men, better for me to live a life of alms, which is what's done by a sannyasi. Arjuna is proposing here to leave the battlefield and live as a sannyasi. It's not going to be discussed here. It will be discussed in chapters 4 and 5, and I think it even comes back again in chapter 18. So that, that conflict between renouncing the world and staying in the world, the roots of that discussion are this verse. The next verse is, you may have heard me say it before, this is my favorite verse in the entire Bhagavad Gita. And surprisingly, it's spoken not by Sri Krishna, <laughs> It's spoken by Arjuna, where he admits his confusion. There's tremendous, tremendous wisdom in being able to admit, I don't know what to do. So often, we don't admit that. We fool ourselves into thinking we're wise enough, we're smart enough, we're strong enough to deal with the situation without seeking help, without seeking advice. It's often a huge mistake. Arjuna doesn't make that mistake. He admits he's overcome by his emotions and he turns to Sri Krishna, please tell me what to do. He's ready to walk off the battlefield. And if Arjuna walks off the battlefield, according to the whole story leading up to this point, the Pandavas will certainly lose the war if Arjuna leaves the battlefield. So the consequences are tremendous, and Arjuna knows that. So in this moment of crisis, Arjuna does absolutely the best thing possible. He seeks advice, and the best advice possible from Sri Krishna. <clears throat> then, Sanjaya said, after saying, I shall not fight, silently Arjuna did sit. Then Lord Krishna began to speak with a slight smile upon his lips. It needs a little explanation here before we go on. You see the spiritual teachings begin with the very next verse. So this is concluding now in Sanjaya's narration, concluding Arjuna's dilemma. Now notice in the previous verse, he says, tell me for certain what is best. I, and then in the next verse he says, after saying, I shall not fight. <laughs> Do you get it? Tell me what to do, 
but don't tell me to fight. <laughs> it just shows the depth of Arjuna's inner turmoil. The other thing to point out is Sri Krishna speaks with a slight smile, having a broader perspective. Arjuna fears the death of his loved ones on the battlefield. Sri Krishna knows no one dies. That's why he can smile. And he sees Arjuna just flailing emotionally. But he knows that there's no reason for that which is exactly what he says. The blessed Lord said, You mourn those who need not be mourned, yet you speak words of wisdom too. The truly wise mourn not for those who are dead and those yet to die. Never have I existed not, nor have you nor these kings of men, nor shall we ever cease to be in the future in later lives. The one who in this body dwells through childhood, youth, and in old age will then another body gain. In this the wise are not confused. These bodies destined to expire all possess an eternal soul, indestructible beyond thought. Therefore go fight, O Arjuna, neither born nor subject to death. The soul will never cease to be eternal and immutable, living on when the body dies, just as one casts away worn clothes, dressing again in new attire. So too when old bodies expire, a soul acquires others new, not by weapons can it be pierced, nor by fire can it be burned, not by waters can it be wet, nor by winds can it withered be, unmanifest beyond all thoughts, unchanging thus our souls described, Therefore, knowing this to be so, you have no reason now to mourn. We'll stop here. Pause here. We may have to stop. We'll see. Um, here is Sri Krishna's opening teaching. And his opening teaching is no one will die because no one was born. Anyone born will die. There's no exceptions. No exceptions. But that which was never born is not subject to death. And this is one of the central teachings of Advaita Vedanta. comes from the Upanishads. Sri Krishna is, in some places, he actually paraphrases the Katha Upanishad, his spiritual discourse is just full of this ancient wisdom, the wisdom of the ancient rishis, which, and he focuses here at the beginning on this most profound spiritual truth. And that is, the essence of who you are was never born. The essence of who you are is what? Who are you? We'll end with it, this uh, little bit of teaching because this is, it's not only the first teaching, it's arguably most important. <clears throat> the essence of who you are, when you say I, what is the essence of that I? Who are you in an essential way? You could exist without an arm, you would still be I, right? Take you, minus one arm. 
You still say, I, I am the same person, right? Minus two arms. Minus two arms and two legs. <laughs> Minus your whole body. I am who I am. Who is that I that remains in the absence of your body? By the way, when you dream, you continue to exist in the absence of your physical body. You have a whole life in your dreams without this physical body, so that's being I am. Whoever is I am is independent of the body further independent of the life force that animates the body and even independent of your thoughts and emotions. Tell me, when you stop thinking, do you cease to exist? Silly, right? If you have no emotions, do you cease to exist? If you go into one of those, it's called sensory deprivation tank, you go and float in, in some liquid, and it's dark, and you can't see, hear, taste, smell, or touch anything. You're floating in that tank. Do you cease to exist <clears throat> without being able to see, hear, taste, smell, or touch? You continue to exist. That I am continues to exist. What is that I am? Most of you can answer that. Consciousness. The awareness of what's happening right now. Now, the consciousness that by which you know what's happening around you, the consciousness by which you know what's happening in your mind, that consciousness is unborn. Your body was born. That consciousness pre-existed your body. And when your body falls, what happens to that consciousness? Not a thing. That which is born is subject to death. This one. But that which is unborn, that which is uncreated, <coughs> is not subject to death. We call this inner self Atma, <clears throat> the, uh, and we call it also the inner divinity, and that's something important there. Divine, <clears throat> divine means having the nature of devas, the God. What about you shares the nature of God? God is unborn and uncreated. Can you say that about your body? No. Can you say that your mind and thoughts are divine? Not necessarily. That consciousness, unborn and uncreated, shares that quality with Ishvara, the god of the cosmos. Unborn, uncreated, that is the inner divinity. This is a good place to stop because with the next verse, we actually shift and discuss not that which is unborn. Birth is certain for all who die, that which is born. So we'll see that in our next class. We'll go through the uh, chapter two. Well, each class will go as, as, uh, as the text allows us to. We're not in a hurry, but at the same time, we don't want to really uh, spend too much time on each, on each verse. So we will continue this. Some announcements. Um, if you like to help out, there's some gardening projects that we'll do immediately after the uh, program. You can meet in the lobby and help with the gardening. Tomorrow we have <coughs> satsang, question and answer period at 6 p.m. Sorry. <coughs> Weather will be nice. We'll meet outside in the, um, in the garden. It's really lovely in the picnic area. So please come and join us, 6 p.m. for uh, uh, satsang. We'll conclude with our brief prayers at the altar. <clears throat> oh.
ಓಂ ಗಣಪತಿಗಂ ನವಾಮಹೆ ಕವಿಂಗೀನಾಪಮಶ್ರವಸ್ತಮ ಜ್ಯೇಷ್ಠರಾಜ ಬ್ರಹ್ಮನ ಬ್ರಹ್ಮನಸ್ಪತಹಾನಶೃನ್ವನ್ ಉತ್ಭಸಿರಸಾರಣ ಮಹಾಗಣಪತ ನಮಃ ಈಶ್ವರೋ ಗುರುರಾತ್ಮೇಥಿ ಮೂರ್ತಿಭೇದ ವಿಭಾಗಿನೆ ವ್ಯೋಮವ್ಯಾಪ್ತೇಹಾಯ ದಕ್ಷಿಣಮೂರ್ತ ನಮಃ ವಸುದೇವಸುಧ ದೇವ ಖಂ ಸಚಾನೂರಮರ್ಡನ ದೇವಕಿ ಪರಮಾನಂದ ಕೃಷ್ಣ ವಂದೇ ಜಗದ್ಗುರು ಓಂ ಸರ್ವೇ ಸುಖಿನ ಸರ್ವೇ ಸಂತು ನಿರಾಮಯ ಸರ್ವೇ ಭದ್ರಿ ಪಶ್ಯಂತು ಮಾ ಕಶ್ಚಿದ್ದುಃಖಭಾಗ್ಭವೇತ್ ಅಸಥೋ ಮಾ ಸತ್ಗಮಯ ಥಮಸೋ ಮಾ ಜ್ಯೋತಿರ್ಗಮಯ ಮೃತ್ಯೋರ್ಮಾ ಅಮೃತಂಗಮಯ ಓಂ ಶಾಂತಿ 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 ಓಂ ಥತ್ಸತ್